Hello, YouTube. T and Rails and Tales coming back at you with Scary Stories from a Railroader, Volume 3. Before we begin our story, though, I would like to ask that you like this video. Comment what you like or dislike about this video or the series. Subscribe to my channel if you're not already subscribed. And hit that notification bell so you know the first second I post new content. Now, turn the lights off. Sit down. Cozy up. And don't mind that noise you just heard downstairs. Are you ready? Scary Stories from a Railroader, Volume 3. This experience happened on the previous division I worked on. I worked the 110 mile main line between Kingsport, Tennessee and Shelby, Kentucky. This route goes to the Appalachian Mountains and also passes through the coal fields and mines that once had the area's dead economy booming. This is now one of the poorest areas in America. You often see almost unlivable shacks with families along the tracks. When I was a young blood, the old heads and locals told me the folklore and tales of the mountain. Just figured I was getting hay since I'd now been here 15 years and I'd never seen any of it. Well, until now. I got called for a train out of Kingsport for 9 p.m. I arrived at the yard office around 8.30 p.m. and greeted my conductor. He was just out of training and this is going to be his first trip. His name was Chris, and after a short conversation, I thought I'd like working with him. We boarded the locomotive, but by 9.30, we were given the track warrants and green light to leave. I notched the throttle back and let her eat. As an engineer, you have to be constantly aware of your surroundings. After leaving, I noticed a little movement in the second unit. Damn hobos, I said. We ended up having to take siding just before going into Virginia and meet another train. I took the opportunity to investigate the movement in the second unit. I turned on the locomotive cab lights and looked around. Engineer seat. Clear. Conductor seat. Clear. At a random bodily urge, I went to the engine bathroom to piss. I unzipped my pants and opened the door to find a 25-year-old young man huddled on the ground shivering. It was the middle of winter, December 23rd to be exact. I got him up, showed him how to work the heater, sat him down. He was just trying to get to Big Stone Gap, Virginia for Christmas. I said, well, you're in luck. We'll slow down so you can get off there. He smiled and thanked me, and I went back to the lead unit because we had been given the green light to leave. We were going through the most rural areas of the route from this point on. It takes a strong mind to do this. The loneliness... The nighttime silence only being broken by your conductor's voice calling signals, and the miles of open track and darkness can get to a weak person. Around 3 a.m. we were approaching Natural Tunnel. All this is a two mile long cave the railroad built track through. A lot of Indians were killed on these hillsides as the railroad built through here. As we went through the Natural Tunnel, our mid-train power locomotive lost radio contact with the lead engine. This put unneeded stress on the couplers causing the train to split in half. We put the train in emergency once we fully stopped we determined the train needed to be walked. Normally the conductor would go alone but Chris was scared. I decided to walk with Chris and we walked by the light of his lantern. Our train was two miles long we found the broken knuckle, coupler for you non-railroaders, about halfway. We fixed the knuckle and I had to leave Chris to return to the locomotive for the reverse recoupling maneuver. I was about three-fourths of the way back to the lead unit before Chris radioed me asking me where I was. I told him, and I got no response, but I proceeded on. I got on the engine and got ready to make the move, so I radioed Chris letting him know I was ready. After about four minutes with no response, I repeated myself. After another two or three minutes, I figured the signal came and went in the cave for our radios. A radio dispatch telling them what happened and to be on standby. I grabbed my flashlight and started making my way back towards Chris. Once I got inside of his lantern, I called to him with a loud echo off the cave walls. All of a sudden, I saw Chris's body go flying between the cars and broken couplers. And he hit the cave with a loud thud. He slid to the ground as my attention was drawn back to the area he was launched from. Some thing was standing there and it must have been 8 to 10 feet tall. Its head turned towards me with the reddest glowing eyes I'd ever seen. 
As soon as it made eye contact with me, it let out the slow guttural gut wrenching growl. He stomped, stomped, stomped. It continued to gain on me. The engine was in sight, so I gave everything I had. I dived for the grab irons and the steps. I caught them. I scurried into the cab and I locked the doors. I looked around the windows and I saw nothing. I radioed dispatch in a panic and told them what happened, though I was barely audible. They told me to proceed with what I had left of train to Big Stone Gap and authorities and another engineer would be there to relieve me. I put the throttle in run aid full throttle. As soon as I stepped off the engine, my legs came out from under me. They were just jello and I fell to the ground. As the EMTs tended to me, I looked up at the second unit and saw those same red glowing eyes at the window that I'd seen before. I passed out after that. I was awoken in the hospital by a very inquisitive detective. He explained to me that they could only identify Chris with dental records. Chris had been mauled so bad they didn't have any animal on record that attacked in that manner. My brain had shut most of it out at the time, so I was useless to the case. As the detective left, he stopped and turned towards me and said, Oh yeah, Mr. T and Rails and Tills, do you know anything about the dead 25-year-old we found in the second unit? We found him with his chest plate broken and his ribs split open from the center. I passed out after that gruesome detail again. Come to find out, a few track workers and hobos that had had family that knew their last whereabouts and cared enough to report them missing disappeared in the same area. I was eventually able to get past all this and go back to work. About a week after returning, I was sitting in the Kingsport locker room. An old head sat down beside me and said, You must be lucky. Not many survive a Wendigo the first time. I transferred to Visions a week later. Okay guys, that's our story for this week. I really hope you enjoyed that. And we'll have another one coming at you next Saturday. Oh yeah, one more thing guys. Like I said in the beginning of the video, hit that like button, subscribe to my channel, share this video to all your friends that want to be a little creeped out, and hit the notification bell so you're aware of the second that I release new content. Thank you guys. We'll see you guys every Saturday around 4 p.m. Hopefully we'll be able to get back on the rail soon. But until then, enjoy the scary stories.